Kia ora, ko Lutaku Ingoa, ko Tumonke uh, Wetere Kura. Uh, hi, my name is Lou, uh, Lou Reddy. Uh, I'm the principal of uh, Wesley Primary School here in Pukitapa, by Mount Ross School. Yeah, so I think it started um, as a new principal, just understanding what we already do. So what is our local curriculum, our maro looks like? And yeah, that started with talking to staff, uh, having whanaungatanga sessions with them. And that gave me real insight because uh, you can have all the lovely things in a paper or on a website, but it's not until you actually talk to people uh, can they actually tell you authentically uh, what they want to change, what they want to grow and amplify. Uh, I started working with um, a, a range of different mentors and principals, uh, Malcolm uh, Milner at Balmoral Primary School and uh, also a few other um, leaders in education. And they started to help me because we had to build a new school. And the cool part about it is that it starts with uh, pedagogy and learning. Um, all of the other things, the desks, the lovely architecture, means nothing unless you have good teaching practice, good learning, good future-focused uh, education happening at the Kurak. Uh, we came across uh, a man named Terry White, and he is uh, based in the UK. Um, he, he was the original uh, editor, uh, along with um, his business partner Murray, uh, that created the first edition of Planning Learning Spaces. That framework has been used uh, globally in hundreds of schools, and we're just another school in Aotearoa that uh, decided to learn a bit more about it. And from that, we started a process by which we could understand our practice, what's working well, what were the challenges, uh, what were the next steps, and how do we define what that looks like and what are we going to do about it. It ultimately led to uh, the creation of a strategy for change. And that strategy for change is divided up into uh, five key themes. And that looks at things like the pedagogy of a school, the curriculum, uh, the organisation of learning, uh, the leadership of learning, and sometimes people call that the agency of learners or uh, the empowerment of learners. And at Tukura Tua Tahi Uetere, we, we believe in empowerment. It's one of our uh, vision statements, you know, to have empowered, respectful, responsible learners. And uh, in, 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 tr in, in my understanding of it is uh, being an ako, and that involves teachers. So we had to be an ako uh, in, in the, the way of learning. And so we went on that journey and we tried to understand what it is that we teach here. And then the final component, the fifth component, is uh, community engagement and whānau engagement. There's actually six parts of the framework that exists um, in the planning, learning spaces and practice framework. The sixth part is uh, uh, research and evaluation. And you do that once you've implemented the first five parts um, in, a, in, a, in a new build. And then you collect data as you go. So we haven't moved in. However, we have been prototyping for the last uh, little while. Sorry, it's a long-winded kōrero, but just to answer that question, how did I get to that place where I can feel like we're on the journey towards future-focused education here? Um, I believe that's been a, a real critical part, so that people have invested in us as a kura, and that's been great for our kids. So it's always been about, for me, uh, creating a school, a, a school that provides that long-term opportunity, and we might plant that seed now, uh, but that will grow and blossom later on. And uh, we, we want to grow you know, engineers, we want to grow scientists, um, architects, mathematicians. Um, and the only way we can really do that is by having a really clear strategy for change that's embedded across the whole school, whether it be learning, whether it be the build, whether it be how we run our community engagement. So all of those things, you know, I think um, help to be united as a staff and give us that uh, connectedness on that on those goals. We had a, a, a quite strong values-based curriculum, and we, at the same time, the parallel time, we've been going on this journey with Maori Achievement Collaborative. I don't know if I told you that ever, <laughs> but um, that's been bubbling away at the background too with all my all my staff, and we did this thing called Unteach Racism. And the modules, what it did was it gave us a systemic lens on the Eurocentric practices that we currently have in our education system and how they failed Māori, Pacifica, migrant. Um, and it also triggered other things around gender diversity as well. Ultimately, it led us to being really critical in our thinking and our reflections of self and how we identify ourselves. As, as adults, as leaders, as teachers. And it meant that we had to go deeper. So I think you've just nailed that deeper aspect of it. 
So our pedagogy, our curriculum design, had to go back to core values of Nako Māori. So we had to start there. We, we started with the Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and then we flowed on from other, other cultures, other, uh, other groups. It really drove everything home for us because it meant that we actually had a purpose for why we were doing it because it was based on a value. Manakitanga and Kaitiakitanga became central to that. And for years we talked about respectfulness and responsibility. And then now all of a sudden we're actually going to the core of those values for our people, for our children. And our staff started to interpret that differently. So how we have chats with each other, how we relate with one another, how we interpret uh, a piece of literature for reading, for example, changes when you use that different lens. So I think we found that massively during the lockdown. We found that especially when we were trying making connections across the screen, that that value became so much more important. So my staff were meeting three times a week online, just really quickly checking in um, in the mornings. It slowly decreased because that, that, that was driven by their own choice, there was less time, but we were meeting every you know every other day and just checking in with, you, with each other. So that's about manakitanga and also kaitiakitanga because we were creating a safe space for people to talk about things. So problems they were having in their planning, problems around you know digi technical stuff but also around curriculum design so that's when we actually started working with terry was actually during um uh, the lockdown so in a way we started practicing hybrid learning for ourselves first before we even introduced it to our kids before we started collaborative practicing in a in a prototyping environment physically we started a uh, I suppose it gave us that opportunity to test something out online, you know, and, and Mac was a classic example, Māori Achievement Collaborative was a classic example. And one of the first sessions we did with um, Matua Phil was we had to have four breakouts so that you could go away and talk about explicit bias in your practice that you've experienced or unconscious bias in another session that we did. So they broke up into these quite tough, meaty reflections and uh, one of the breakouts just didn't go away and they, they just stayed there having their corridor and they didn't even come back so we, I had to close that break up. <laughs> but stuff like that it really helped us to sort of understand how do we create manaki how do we create kaitiakitanga and then practice it in the real world I suppose in front of our children prototyping was a key part of it so allowing people to test out stuff um, we did um, one, like a termly walkthrough so we tested out something and then during the term we would go through and just show each other and, and say, hey, we tried this, it didn't work. Uh, this worked great. Examples of real practice. Um, like a reading tumble in a normal pre-COVID world, pre-hybrid world, would have just been managed by one teacher. But imagine a reading tumble being managed by four teachers, three learning assistants, 90 kids. That's what we tested out. And we've gotten really good at it because we gave our staff the opportunity to not fail, fail is not the right word, but kind of make mistakes because th there was no failure in it. A mistake is something that you learn from, so therefore you win out of it. So yeah, I think they got that. I think deep down my staff feel like they could take those risks, try something, and I and I do believe that they know each other now more through those um, activities around Nako Māori that Matua Phil introduced us to through um, those workshops, but also um, they know their kids more because now they try to practice that with their relationships with their children too. I mean, they were already doing it before I even got here, but they just kept building on it. And um, yeah, I think we are lucky to have a staff that practices manakitanga every day. And uh, when they don't, when they have a hard day, maybe they've had a lot of with their partner or something like that, we look after each other and we talk about it. So I think um, everything goes back to values. So everything is built on that foundation. Yeah, I, I, I feel really um, lucky that they've created that and I've just facilitated. So I've asked them what, what would work for them. And those Tanga sessions that I've had since I started here, we've had another one last year as well. It's not an appraisal, it's a chance to just, you know, get everything off your chest and people tell me what they want. And um, when we talked about like, say, professional development that worked for them, their most, you know, the things that they loved was actually to do activities together. So um, Matua Hari, um, Hari, um, Hari uh, who's our co-Matua, uh, Hako Brown, um, Matua Phil, 
Brenda McPherson, they all got together for this Matariki celebration um, earlier. And uh, the staff like just planned that all together. And by doing things together, celebrating together, having a hangi together, having things that they love doing, going bowling together, um, they've led that. And um, sometimes I just have to hustle for the funding and and um, get the right putia to, to support it. But uh, ultimately, I think they've had a say in it. And it's not, it's actually not been me, honestly. I think they, uh, people like Shelley, Sam, Suchi, they genuinely, they they know they know the team more than I do. And um, I've been lucky, I just follow their advice and guidance. So I think the only thing I really have done, really, strategically in that space is to listen and to, to try to deliver when I say I'm gonna do something. <laughs> Often in education, we use these terms like graduate profile or learner profile that we co-design with our whanau. And I think we've had different versions of that at, at Te Kora Tōtahi Uetiri. I think we're, we are on a journey where through Talanoa, we've been able to find out what, it's mean, what is meaningful for the, for the children, for the ako, akomanga and for, for all staff, I think they have a desire to learn that. But I think it doesn't really exist until it's written down. That's my personal opinion. Unless it's boldly stated on a wall, this is what we aspire our children to be, this is where we're going. Um, you know, the Wayfinders, the Totai or Lemoana group that I've been involved in, they talk about a Totai looking out and seeing an island that isn't on the horizon yet, but you know it's there. And you know how you're going to take your people on your waka to that island. And if our children are preparing themselves to get to that place, we are just uh, a small vessel along that journey to help them there. Their whanau, all of their um, culture, their belief, that's behind them too. That's providing the sails, the wind and sails. So I think that's what's going to drive us there. But I think we have to, as an education community, understand the pathways that enable that to happen. And we're just one small piece. We're, we're a six-year foundational piece. Actually, not we're not even that. Because ECE is actually the founder. Fano, ECE, us, you know, we're the third group of significant adults that has anything to do with those children. And so when we embrace them as a Fano, when they come here, we have to understand them. We have to know the learner profile or graduate profile. And then we have to do everything that we possibly can. And we have to give them the best that they deserve. And I think sometimes some education systems out there fail our kids because they don't see the island way off in the distance. They just see their time here and just get that kid through and then that's none of our business. So I, I, I think, yeah, we have a responsibility to get that right. Once again, I feel lucky at this kura that we're part of a coal community of learning. We're looking at that space, looking at those opportunities because all the data shows is that Māori Pacifica uh, learners aren't able to um, be shown in a positive light in the media. They're not being shown in a positive light in the data and assessments or academia either. But I know they're the top achievers in my school. Māori kids are the top achievers in my school. The data shows that. But it doesn't show up on the Herald front page, does it? I think sometimes um, it can be quite disheartening thinking about it. But we have to do something about it now. We have to think outside the square. I'll give you an example of one thing that we're doing differently here is that we've worked with um, Kofi Intermediate and Mount Abbott Grammar around um, rocketry. And so we've been teaching our kids how to uh, make a rocket, send it up 200 metres in a year, and then um, the Tōkana Tainer model is used with the intermediate and the high school students, and then they come and work with our kids on that. And last term they did that, and Sam's Kia kids flew rockets higher than the Mount Abbott Grammar kids. And I was really proud of them. Because that, that showed that they had learned something, they had thought about what they were doing, they understood the scientific concepts, and man, they were having fun in their learning. So one of those kids might be the next Peter Beck, and I believe that they will be. One of the, one of the bits of research that's sort of really hot at the moment, and often people quote it a lot, is culturally sustaining practice, or culturally sustaining frameworks. And for our kura, we've just been unpacking that in response to unteach racism. It has to start with your belief system for Māori Pacifica learners. It has to start at that foundational level. Because 
if you compare the stats, they can be as successful, if not more successful, than any other group in New Zealand. So if we start with that belief system, then we would see investment in those groups at the same levels. Because people complain about Māori Pacifica scholarships, but they never look up the data in terms of the spending in those scholarships versus the amount of all of the other business investment, ma and pa networks, the old boys network, what the value, the economic capital is behind that group. So it's just a drop in the bucket, Māori Pacifica scholarships actually, when you compare. If I went to Auckland Boys Grammar, the networks that I would have, the old boys network included, that's a real life thing that our children are gonna soon experience, is that they will be judged firstly on their CV letter, even without meeting them, is their name. Then the next thing is the first introduction and that first, if they can cut through that, maybe their degree, their qualifications got them into the interview, they had a good reference. The next thing is the judgment that the person on the other side of that desk will have against them, because they'll probably be European, they'll probably be male, and they'll probably have no idea how to say their name properly. So that's the next interaction that will be against them. And then following that, once they got the job, if they got the job, and we're talking, say, the tech, the tech industry, you probably have more data than I do, that's going back five years, it was something like 2% or 3% of hires, Māori Pacifica. So if you did even cut it through there, then maintaining good working relationships, having one significant friend in a workplace makes a huge difference. Imagine being in a workplace where you're the only brown, brown person or you know, person of colour, you know, you're not going to last very long. You're not going to have that opportunity. And the criticism and the judgment and the performance uh, expectations on you will be 10 times that of anyone else. I get quite emotional about it because I've actually come from that background. I, you know, I grew up in South Auckland, Manero High, all of that. I know what it's like. I know the judgment that exists. So removing the, um, the heart and mind equation is actually quite hard for me. I think our children experience that and in order to be successful in, in education, they bring so much cultural capital, they bring so much street credibility that, you know, if you went to some of the schools that I know, you know, St. Ken's or anything like that, you're not going to have that same capital that you bring to that world. And I'm not just talking about the corporate sector, I'm talking about building, engineering, you know. Some of my best mates have uh, come from those backgrounds and they've become the top of their field. But someone gave them the chance, someone had to think outside of the racist uh, education and economic system that currently exists and political system that currently exists. So I really think education plays a part in that. Uh, NZ History's curriculum, Aotearoa History's curriculum, the backlash that people saw on that alone shows how racist we still really are. I think our, our data and hybrid learning as well as just here at school shows that our kids can perform. They can, they can beat the norm. They can, um, they can keep up. If not, you know, go past all those expectations, smash those expectations. So I think it's possible. Um, I'd love to see more Maori and Pacifica principles around. I'd love to see more um, ministers, uh, leaders in education that that come out to our schools and actually listen and see what's actually happening at the coalface. I think it has to be a combined effort. It can't just be like squeaky wheel over here at Wesley Primary, with Teddy. It's got to be, it's got to, you know, I, I'm inviting every every person, every leader out there to have a think about what they're doing and how we can work collaboratively because our kids deserve it and they, yeah, they deserve the best from us. So I think that's enough of a challenge. So the tests that we use are not equitable for the outcome that we need to see. It's slightly different to equality, because equality says you use the same test for everyone, therefore you'll get the outcome that you want. But has that really worked? And it hasn't. So we, as a school, are trying different ways to assess, and uh, DIMIC, Developing Mathematical Inquiring Communities, is an example of that. So children assessing with each other what they've learned, so that they co-construct their success criteria. The teachers plan it. They, you know, there is a lot of framing around the uh, launching, the questioning. There's a lot of uh, talk moves around what happens within those groups, the social norms that's needed to create that. 
But Dr. Bobby Hunter has done the research to prove that given that right conditions in that group, those children will identify what their next learning steps are. And that is formative teaching. For me, teaching is a mastery subject. That's, it shouldn't ever be, and especially in primary school, a summative assessment which is then used to mainstream group you into a class for high school that has no effect until your fifth year. You know, year 13 is the first year where you really need to have some type of summative assessment to prove that you are worthy enough to go to university. So yet we use the same framework. Do children really need to be conditioned for 13 years to know that you know, they didn't meet um, a white person's entry test into a university, created in Oxford University or Cambridge University? I don't think so. I think our children love maths here at our school because they love the way that Dimmick is structured. Uh, I'll give you an example. We, we ran a, a holiday program for maths <laughs> this year. And I was thinking initially, oh yeah, we'll get maybe five kids or 10 kids and that's great. We had 45 kids or 10 every day. Maths in the holidays because they love it and they were they knew that they were successful at it too because every day they were building on the activities that they'd done before and the maths facilitators from Massey University as they were researching and they're talking to the kids about it they knew that the kids were learning our staff knew that they were learning so there is better ways of assessment there is far more formative teaching practices that allow for children to be successful especially Māori and Pacifica if you said to some of my kids, are you learning maths? They probably won't even, they don't know that they're learning maths because they're actually doing it in an integrated way. Say, last week we did Diwali. So they were learning about Diwali. <laughs> maths and integrated into Diwali. And that's how Dimmick works, is that you're actually using the capital of the children, the cultural capital of the children, to not just get engagement, but actually to get conversation happening. And through those co-constructed, conversations, they then figure out how to solve the maths part of it. Problem solving in a group is actually what most workplaces are doing now. You know, no one no one just sits in an office and goes, aha, I've got an idea, and then they launch it. You've got to run through 20 different lines of validating and pitching, and finally it might get to some manager that will then go, okay, well, where's the business case behind? And then another team kicks in, and another team. And so children co-constructing being critical thinkers, problem solvers, is all of those skills that's captured in that Dimmick session. But I'm also seeing that now in literacy as well. So our our reading activities have changed. So instead of children just doing one output from their reading task, which is often like a, a lovely summary or a close, they're picking lots of different outputs from that. So children end up doing a reading session, they might have a debate or they might create a model or a DLO for their blog, or a game. You know, I've seen kids come up with a, a Minecraft, uh, um, you know, model for what they've just done in their reading sessions. So we're not the measurement tool has shifted here. I believe the shift has started in some schools, and an example of that could be seen in, in practices in, in Dimmick, which are culturally sustaining, whereby children are starting to use problem solving, collaboration thinking about the answer in many different ways and many different lenses as well. Not just a Eurocentric uh, Cambridge or Oxford model of you know, computational algorithmic thinking, which X plus Y equals you know, whatever. It's very much about valuing a diverse way of thinking, actually. And I appreciate that our kids love it. And you know, 45 kids in the school holidays coming in daily to do maths, who would have thought? Um, but they don't know that they're doing maths. They actually, what they're doing is problem solving with their mates. You know, it's gamified as well because every time they pitch it to each other, they get a real buzz out of it and they get feedback. They get the questions to go deeper from each other. So the teacher is just facilitating that. Whereas when I did maths, it was open a book, learn the quickest way to understand that algorithm as much as fast as I could, or memorize the so we'll go to the back of the book and look at the answer, which is strategy in itself. But I think we've moved past that transactional way of teaching. We have looked at 
the research behind what Dr. Bobby Hunter has done and applied it to our school. It's not easy though. It takes years. And some staff, it's a struggle because it is the antithesis of the kaupapa of teaching that we've been told to do, which is from the front. Whereas things like story chat and uh, T-shaped literacy, which uh, I've seen here at the school and um, been part of the lessons, I, you know, I think kids are starting to see themselves as driving that learning, being empowered through that process. So the leadership of learning is starting to change. That is one of our uh, strategic pillars that in, in our strategy for change. And I think some of this uh, PLD that we've done has helped with that, but it, it does take years. It's not, um, you know, you can't just pay someone and then magically it happens in one term. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a change in practice that we're talking about and it starts with us. The kids, you know, will benefit from it but we also benefit from it too. I think um, you know, it gets pretty boring when you're just using the same textbook every year. How much more powerful is it when the child gets up, talks about what they understood, and then they are challenging themselves and each other, uh, thinking critically. So in the future-focused uh, world, I think um, you know our kids are learning those skills of collaboration because most workplaces now are collaborative workplaces. Uh, there are also places where you have to problem solve when something gets tricky and sticky. You're in the learning pit with each other. Um, the answers aren't always given by a manager anymore. And I also think the idea of uh, being able to do your pitch from the front uh, actually is a, is a great skill to have because, you know, it's the second or third worst fear that most people have. So if we're building that skill set now for our children, um, how much more powerful they will be, and they already are, but how much more skills will they have when they get to... Um, it, 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 sometimes I think about um, Ken Robinson's um, corridor around creativity in here as well. And I think that we're not just trying to uh, give the kids a prerequisite skill in math to be able to become an architect. What we're trying to do is so they can think critically like an architect instead. Because there's lots of careers out there that our kids could do. And... It's just about igniting a passion in them and connecting it to their culture because their culture has value. And for a long time, you know, in the staff room, the saying was, oh, they don't understand that maths concept because the problem in the test was an experience or a statement, a word statement that had no relationship to their culture or their background. So we're removing those barriers because we're not asking those questions anymore or we're trying not to. It does happen though. There's still some summative forms of assessment that's still out there and there is still measuring sticks that we have to jump through. But um, I, I hope and I survive to live the day when those assessments are no longer relevant. That as a primary school, we don't have to prove that one of our kids is at stay nine, whatever. Because um, they don't need to right now. They don't need to jump through that hope until they get to that level when they want to maybe get into university. Yeah, I think um, that community and whānau engagement, you know, we've talked about that a few times. And I think for lots of schools that strive to make a connection with their families and their local community, their hapori, it, it boils down to often the, the leader or the leaders, the senior leadership, the board of trustees, uh, leading from the front and, and making those connections. And I think there was a silver lining in, in lockdown. Um, we were able to set up things like our food bank, our pastoral care outreach through Global Hope Missions, go Peter and Tiri Leilua. Hopefully you make that. <laughs> but um, yeah, those guys um, taught me something about building those homeschool partnerships that have had a long and lasting impact on, on my leadership. And I think it's got to do with people about respect, um, whakaoiti, being able to really treat people with respect. And uh, through crises sometimes, you know, you, you have to really respect whatever background. doesn't matter if they've got no food in their cupboards today. doesn't matter if they couldn't get their kids to the school in a van that's broken down. It doesn't matter. You respect them as humans, as parents of your children, and you do everything you possibly can to uh, meet them halfway, and sometimes even more than halfway. And I think seeing that role modelled in this community for over, you know, close to 13 years um, has taught me that that, that, that creates a lot of credibility. So that when you're building a new school and you're introducing modern learning environments, uh, <laughs> which can be actually quite different 
for our Māori Pacifica families. They never, you know, maybe they didn't experience that in their own education system back home or even here in New Zealand, Aotearoa. It's meant that um, they had a high level of trust in us as educators and me as a leader, as a tomoake, to try something different and then talk about it. So every time we've had the opportunity, you know, our big events, we've had the displays out, we've talked about it, we've got their feedback, and they gave us plenty of good feedback. And it's um, empowered us to keep going. So it's reciprocal. Sometimes education people can think that we are doing something for our community, but actually we're doing something with our community. And that takes trust, takes respect. Um, those val- it goes back to values again and actually living it and practicing it so most of our parents can detect bullshit from a mile away so it's great that you know when we when we say that we're doing something they come and they support us with it yeah they know that we're doing it for the right reasons and I think um, for for that digital space especially and especially for that hybrid space during the lockdowns we saw awesome engagement it slowly trickled off and maybe it's because it's better just to come in you know, during our Talanoa Ako sessions, we saw about 50% of our parents engage and come in and the other 50% wanted to have things, you know, sent to them and whatnot. And I'd like to see a day where our parents, majority of our parents, could come into a school and see their culture, their um, beliefs, their values reflected through what we do, our pedagogy, our teaching, our everything, the physical environment as well as the way we treat them so that they feel valued. And I think we're getting towards that lens, um, that view. But um, yeah, I I think we're definitely on the journey for it. And um, yeah, we've received great feedback on that too. So it it reinforces that. So our staff, you know, really get get a buzz out of that when, when we're valuing our kids' cultures and their families' cultures because they feel good about that. They feel like they're, they're, you know, growing in their own capacity. Thank you.